and welcome to worship. I'm Leslie Shalutney, the Director of Discipleship and Service here at Webster Hills, and we are so very glad you could join us online today. Well, we're continuing our series called Stories Matter. We will see what lessons we can learn from our favorite Broadway hits over the next few weeks. Today, we are looking at Mary Poppins. Well, down below, you'll find the link for all of our resources for worship. Click, out, click on that to find the Connect card. You can also give and check out all of the events happening at Webster Hills over the summer. And if you're watching live with us today, I invite you to say hello in the comments below. I'll be worshiping online with you as well on Sunday morning, and I would love to say hi. Well, welcome to worship, everyone. Hello, friends. Thank you for worshiping with us online here at Webster Hills United Methodist Church. We're going to open with a song called Bring Forth the Kingdom. Today, we're going to talk about us being the salt and light and how we can add joy and happiness and good things to all that we come in contact with and all people we come in contact with. We can be the extra seasoning that makes life so much better for ourselves and for other people. And so as Christians, we're called to do that. And so let's sing together, Bring Forth the Kingdom. You are the salt of the earth, O people, salt for the kingdom of God. Let's sing together. give you thanks for the gifts and the talents that you've given each one of us so that we can spread those out to anyone that we meet. God, for the people that we come in contact this week, I pray that you allow us to show your love and to show your kindness and your mercy to them. God, let us be the salt of the earth and let us show your love to all those we come in contact with. Even people we see online or go through on Facebook or maybe even people who aren't right in front of us. But God, send us the salt and send us the light so that we can spread that with those around us. Thank you for this time of worship. In your son's name, amen. Good morning, Webster Hills. I'm Kyle. And Elijah. And we're so glad you're joining us for our children's moment today. Today, we are hearing all about Mary Poppins and that in a little bit of hard work, we should find the fun. And that comes from a song called A Spoonful of Sugar Helps the Medicine Go Down. Elijah, what do I have here today? Medicine. Medicine. And what do you think about this medicine? It's yucky. Yeah, you don't think it tastes very good, do you? No. No. So, what if I said you have to take this medicine, but if you do, I'll give you a spoonful of sugar. sugar. How would you feel about that? No, 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 you don't want a spoonful of sugar. That's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So we may not always want 
a spoonful of sugar, but the kids in Mary Poppins thought that was a neat idea and it made things a little easier. But really what Mary was trying to say that when there's hard work to be done, that we should find the fun in it. And God tells us the same thing. In anything we have to do, the work or we toil, that's another word for work, we need to find ways to find enjoyment, fun. So if we're doing gardening and we're digging holes, it's always fun to find the wiggly worms. worms. Or when we're watering the plants, maybe squirt each other with the hose. <laughs> Is that pretty fun? Yeah. So lots of ways to find fun in the work you do. So this week, we challenge you, as you're doing work and tasks that maybe not be as much fun as you'd like them to be, find a way to make it fun. And I hope, as you do, you think about that, that God sends enjoyment and fun for each of us. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, we thank you that we can learn from Mary Poppins and the song, Spoonful of Sugar Helps the Medicine Go Down that in all the work that must be done, you help us find the fun. God, be with us this week. And as we toil, as we work, help us to find the fun and that spoonful of sugar at the end. In Jesus' name, amen. you have always trusted to teach you everything you need to know about life. And by that, I mean the people who, who make movies for Disney. What does it mean when you learn that they've not always been truthful about the stories they tell? The character of Mary Poppins was created by the author P.L. Travers back in 1934. And in her novels about Mary Poppins, they were written for adults, by the way, and not for children. Mary is stern, she is vain, she is an absolute rule follower. Now, Travers does give her a magical side, but perhaps not as whimsical as she was when the Disney folks began to tell her story. Travers, by the way, was very unhappy with the way that her first book about Mary Poppins was treated by Disney and she did not want the company to have anything to do with any more of her work ever again. And I actually kind of like the way that the author described Mary Poppins. Not that I don't love the way she comes across in the movie and the ways that she's been presented on stage, because I do, she's delightful in every way. But I think that P.L. Travers may have been able to capture the conflict that so many of us face when we're trying to navigate our way through life. Rules mean something. Rules, generally anyway, are in place to give us boundaries, guideposts. They're there to keep things orderly and to keep us safe. Sometimes strict rule following doesn't work. But even though the original and the Disney version of Mary Poppins were people who followed the rules and taught the rules, taught children especially, and others around them to do the same, what Mary Poppins possessed was a knack for knowing, a knack for knowing when a bit of fun was needed, when some magic was needed, and maybe even a bit of rule breaking or rule bending at least was needed. She did so not because she wanted to cause trouble or upset the order of things just because. She did so because she saw value, value in finding time to find the good in every part of life. With the movie, with the stage production, those lessons come to us through lyrics, songs like a, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. And then in that same song, in every job that must be done, there is an element of fun. Mary Poppins knew how to find the time to find the good. She came into the life of the Banks family at a time when they were under stress. They were going through some changes. 
trying to keep things orderly and looking good to those who were watching them. The Banks family can't seem to keep a nanny, though. Maybe it's because the children like to cause problems for their nannies. Mr. Banks is focused on his career at the bank, and Mrs. Banks is very involved in the movement to give the women the right to vote. So Mr. Banks, George, now that they've gone through several nannies, has decided that this time he is going to be the one to hire the next nanny, and this person will be someone who is very stern, very much a rule maker and a rule follower. But instead, magically, Mary Poppins arrives on the scene and she takes the job. Now, the rules that are broken have more to do with the natural order of things, who or what can or cannot fly, and the number of items that can be stored in one small carpet bag, and the ability to swoop up a chimney and then take part in an epic dance number across the rooftops of 19th century London. Who among us, though, doesn't hit the point somewhere along the way where we simply wish that there were more rules in life than there are mysteries? Any major change in our routines brings with it a certain amount of anxiety and questions, questions about what to do and when to do it. And, you know, you bring home a new baby, you wish there was a rule book, you face a frightening illness and you wish there was a rule book and you grieve, you change jobs, you buy a house, you sell a house, you break up, you start a new relationship, you, you move to a new place, you become an, an empty nester, you start school, you graduate. All of these moments in life and, and many, many more are just places where we may find ourselves saying, isn't there a book or something I can read that will help me understand what's happening here. But even scripture reminds us that most of life can be best approached with an awareness that what we think ought to be happening is usually not what's best. We are looking this morning at one of Jesus' earliest sermons or teaching moments with his disciples. And what I find remarkable about this place in the Gospel of Matthew is where and when this happens and all that comes before it. It happens very early in Jesus' ministry. We are only at chapter 5 at this point. And what Matthew has shared so far in the story of Jesus is Jesus' time in the wilderness without any food and water for 40 days, 40 nights. Jesus is very close to John the Baptist, and in the early chapters of the gospel, Jesus learns that John has been arrested. Jesus has just now started to preach, and he's called the disciples to be with him. Look at what has brought Jesus to this point. A stressful situation, grief and anger and a new career path and all of that has just opened up and he's just now getting to know these people who he has called to be in ministry with him and large crowds have heard about him and are starting to follow and press in on him. It's enough to make any one of us say, you know, I actually need a vacation now. Can we work that into my contract maybe a little early? But what Jesus does instead is gather the disciples around him, gathers them around him for a talk, and the talk is about how to be happy, not how to manage, not how to restore order, just how to be happy. And the advice he gives, it's upside down, it's rule bending, it's unexpected kind of advice. Happy are people who are hopeless because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are people who grieve because they will be made glad. Happy are people who are humble because they will inherit the earth. Happy are people who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness because they will be fed until they are full. Happy are people who show mercy because they will receive mercy. Happy are people who have pure hearts because they will see God. Happy are people who make peace 
because they will be called God's children. Happy are people whose lives are harassed because they are righteous, because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Much of the Mary Poppins movie is built around the song Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. And when the daughter Jane shares that word with her father, she explains it as a word that you use when you don't know what to say. And her dad, though, responds, I always know what to say. And he's already said, a British bank is run with precision. A British home requires nothing less. Tradition, discipline, and rules. Without them, disorder, chaos, moral disintegration. That's what he said. That way of life does not last. George Banks soon finds himself facing uncertainty. His job, his livelihood, his, his reputation, his place in his family, all of them are under question. Now it's a Disney music, musical movie, so, so songs are sung and dances are danced and kites are flown and all ends well. But before all of that happens, George Banks finds himself coming to grips coming to grips with a new way of looking at life and what makes for a truly successful life. And that's one that is more about happiness than achievement. As one writer describes it, to find redemption, Mr. Banks needs to become poor in spirit. His self-image needs to change. And while he first sees himself as self-made and rich and orderly and serious and always in control and competent, he needs to see himself as incapable, at a loss, and completely undone. And as he gains this humble identity, he finds freedom to experience joy and intentionally love his family. Incapable, at a loss, completely undone. That may not sound like happiness to any of us here, but at the heart of it all is a realization that what makes life happy is what makes life meaningful, and what makes life meaningful is finding time to find the good. The biggest moment of chaos in the movie is when George's young son, Michael, he accidentally causes a scene at the bank. He wants to spend his money, his tuppence, to buy food from the elderly bird woman. He doesn't want to invest it in the bank. And while the investment may indeed grow and become bigger and bigger, he sees happiness in helping the woman and helping the birds. He's a living example of happy are those who show mercy because they will receive mercy. I don't like to think of myself as incapable or at a loss or completely undone. I'm a little more like the Banks family early in the movie. I need a life, I think, that unfolds in an orderly way. I, I have plans, I have expectations, I have things to do, people to see. I'm not always patient. And I know what I want and when I want it, and I want it now. And I don't have a magical nanny floating in and out of my life to teach me something about all of that. But I do have Jesus. I had Jesus who had the wisdom to take a moment when he was in the middle of all sorts of changes and transitions to take a moment to say to those around him, let's just pause. Let's name what's important here. Let's name what is true. Let's take the time to find the good. And what is good? Letting go of control, being willing to bend, being willing to be humble, willing to offer grace and mercy, willing to find the good even in the midst of life's hardest moments. This past week, I heard another preacher remind me that in God's economy, nothing is wasted or lost. Speaking to Missouri churches across the state, Reverend Fred Lee said this. He said, even our experiences of challenge and pain and grief and trauma all can serve a holy and redemptive purpose. And that means that every loss, every loss experienced, every lesson learned, every new venture tried, can be leveraged by the Holy Spirit to enhance and empower and inform our work and witness as we seek to fulfill our mission.
the Banks family thinks they need a nanny. They think they need a nanny who will run a house in an orderly way, but they get Mary, who is unconventional in every possible way. And we get Jesus, unconventional Jesus, upside down thinking Jesus. And it may not show up in this passage, but we also get Jesus who understood grief, understood the value of taking a pause, a break, of getting rest. He understood the relief that can come from expressing your anger or your sadness or any emotion, really. And we get Jesus who said to his disciples and said to us, even in your grief, your hopelessness, your lack of control, here is what I want you to do. Be light. Jesus finished his teaching with this instruction. A city on top of a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on top of a lampstand and it shines on all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so they can see the good things you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. Is it possible that we sometimes think about our faith as being all about the rules, all about the things we're supposed to do and not do? Or is it possible that for too long we have let people who look at faith from the outside think of it that way? And for that reason, they're not curious about what faith in Jesus can offer. I want us to think about our faith as a way of life that is about surprise and innovation and fun. And it's not just about the rules. It's not just about the work. It's about following an out of the ordinary Savior. It's about believing in a God who shows up in the most unplanned and unexpected ways. And I think, too, that we would all be so very blessed by knowing your stories. When has God surprised you? When has a moment that looked hopeless turned into a moment of promise? When has God shown up in an unexpected way? When did a point of letting go, of control, of, of showing mercy, of seeking righteousness lead to greater happiness? If you're willing to share your story so others can know this isn't just a Disney movie idea, but a real part of life and faith, let's make that happen. My email address is below, and you can find me on Facebook and Twitter and, and Instagram. Life is often hard, often stressful, often full of questions. Not always, of course, not always. But in all of life's moments, we are in the company of a God who loves us and taught by the example and the words of Jesus and guided by the presence of Spirit who whispers to us over and again, find the time to find the fun. Or whisper supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, Take your pick. Amen. Amen. We would like to say thank you for all the ways you supported ministries of Webster Hills. From ministries down the hall like kids and youth, to outside of our doors providing books and resources to help children advance in their education, or around the world providing resources for Kenya at a school, or sending people to a mission trip in Puerto Rico. Your offering is an act of worship. Your love is shown to those here and all around the world. Will you pray with me? God of boundless generosity, as we offer our gifts and our lives to you, we long to grow as disciples so that we'll grow in generosity. The abundance we've been given is on purpose and in your plan that we might know the joy of sharing that abundance. We long for that vision of your kingdom where loving hearts bring a better balance between abundance and need. In the name of Christ, our teacher and redeemer, we pray. Amen. So we are so honored that you choose to worship with us each week. Thank you so much. And your gifts are important to the life of this church. So we invite you to give online by following the link below. Thank you for being our guest in worship today. Hi all, it's time for Next Steps. Time to talk about how we can connect 
and take our next steps in faith together. In every job that must be done, there is an element of fun, said Mary Poppins. Let's find time to do the good. This week we will surprise someone with an invitation, a gift, an act of service or kindness. Give them a card, a call, or even just a flower from your garden. Plan a fun time with friends or family and surprise someone and make the mundane fun. Who will you bless this week? Who is coming to your mind? See you all in Webster Hills later this week for continuing the discussion and the conversation. Have a great week. Well, we're not going to sing a song about holding your light up without singing this little light of mine. This is a wonderful spiritual that I love singing, and so often we think of it as a children's song. But as the scripture stated today, it's a wonderful song for all of us to share and to be able to share our light with all people. So let's sing together this little light of mine. <laughs> 